Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to this after work event with us from The Hunger Project and FUF, the Swedish Development Forum. Uh, today we would like to give a warm welcome to our guest Irene Naikali, who's flown here all the way from Uganda to take part in the International Environment Conference, Stockholm Plus 50. My name is Natalie Lashage and I will be moderating this event today. Uh, it will be structured as a conversation with Irene about her work in the development sector and the current situation for women. Uh, so there will be time for questions afterwards. So if you have any, like if you think of something while she's talking or if you just come up with something you want to ask her, then remember it or write it down and there will be times to ask them later on. Moving forward to Irene, a program management specialist with over 15 years of senior level experience uh, in managing gender focused community led development programs. She has accomplished a lot in her career and will hopefully talk a little bit about it today. Uh, but to introduce her to all of you, she has worked with empowering women, ending violence against women, HIV prevention and care, amplifying community voices and organizing the private sector towards sustainable food systems. Uh, so without further ado, let's give a warm applaud and a big welcome to Irene. Yes. Welcome Irene. I want to start by letting you introduce yourself. Uh, we haven't worked together for so long. I've only been at the Anger Project for six months and I guess that many in the crowd don't know you. Uh, so if you could just introduce your role at the Hunger Project and maybe the Hunger Project overall and your work there. Okay, thank you very much Natalie. I'm happy to be here. My name is Natalie Andrews. I work for the Hunger Project in Uganda as the head of programs. I've been with the Hunger Project for the last five years and in my capacity as head of programs I oversee all the community related programs that Hunger Project is implementing in an effort to eradicate hunger and poverty from our uh, communities in Uganda. The Hunger Project, um, just a little bit background about, about the Hunger Project work in Uganda. It started about 22 years ago, and um, we are implementing a community, a gender-focused community-led development approach that uh, focuses on uh, putting communities at the forefront of ending of addressing the is their own issues that are kind of plugging them into continuous hunger, food insecurity, and poverty. And in the way we do our work, our work is, it hinges around three important pillars. Uh, the first pillar being the women as the key change agents within the communities. We believe that when we work with the community, with the women, when we change a woman, when you when you influence a woman and give them the platform to be able to be the agents of change, then you're able to influence the entire community. So when we start with the women, we work with the women and um, put them at the forefront of mobilizing their fellow community members. So the community, the mobilization of the community is the other pillar on which our programs work. Uh, in the sense that we are not only going to be working with the woman, but we also work, need to work with the entire community, the men, the women, the children, because at the end of the day, our overall vision as the Hunger Project is to see a world where every man, woman, and child lives a healthy, fulfilling life of self-reliance and dignity. So when we use the woman to mobilize the fellow <coughs> the community members, then we feel that we're able to do this. Then the other third very important pillar of now work is working with in partnership with the government, the local government. Uh, because as Hunger Project, we are an international NGO and we come into these communities basically to supplement the work of the government. So we are not coming over to do what the government is supposed to do, but just to fuel, to kind of um, give them that fuel, that momentum to be able to uh, do what they're actually supposed to do. So we come in to fill the gaps, but in filling the gaps, we move hand in hand with the government. So when we go into these communities, which are so vulnerable and we feel that they need to be supported, we enter the community through the government. So we, we, we start with the local government, uh, we talk to them about the Hunger Project work globally, what we are doing, and get their buy-in. 
get that sense of um, feeling that you know they, we can be equal partners, we can be partners in this whole development agenda. So once they, we've gotten the buy-in of the local government, so it's the local government that introduces us to the community and actually ident helps us to identify that particular area, that particular community or village or district where um, um, parish where we need to center our focus. So once we go into these communities, when we go with the you know with the government, the community is able to accept us. They don't look at us as you know investors coming from America, coming from Sweden, coming to grab their land because we are going to be working with them and we also need them to make some commitments. So the, gap, the district introduces us and to this particular community and makes them realize that you know, these are partners, these are our friends who have come to work with us. Then they step in the background and then we now engage with the communities. But throughout our work, the district, the, the local government is a part and parcel of it. So one of the key commitments that we request from the communities as we are beginning our engagements is for them to um, donate land or to, uh, to identify areas where we're going to establish our symbol partnership. So they, because in our epicenter strategy, in our model, we, we build infrastructure. So we build infrastructure because we realize this is one of the gaps. So if you when you talk about issues of vulnerability in the communities, we're talking about issues of hunger. We're not only looking at lack of food to eat, but we're looking at hunger in a very holistic manner. If people are not able to have access to health services, if they're not having access to clean water, if they're not having access to education opportunity, to schools where their children can go to school, you know, cannot be able to talk about human farming. You cannot be able to talk about, you know, uh, sustainable farming. If people don't have even where to farm. So when we go with the districts, we expect them to, to make a commitment to offer land where we're actually going to work with the communities to demonstrate, to have the, the communities demonstrate and then be able to kind of support them along the way until we transition. So um, working with the local government has actually been a very, very key pillar in our work because when, when, we, when we work with it, we usually, our methodology, our approach requires us to stay with these communities between five to eight years. And after eight years, we let them, we leave them as they go on their own. But after we've established these structures, the structure has a health center. So we build the health center, we do the mobilization, we do the education sensitization, and the government has to come in to equip the health center. So they take them on as their uh, government managed health facilities. So our job is to set up the infrastructure, mobilize communities, create awareness, then the district comes, the government comes in to uh, equip. Then when it comes to the schools, we build the school, and we, we set up the structure for the school, and then the government has to come in and do that. So kind of like we are supporting the government to, you know, give them a lead into what they're supposed to do. So in a nutshell, that is what we do with the communities and the women are the, the main focus because we realize the biggest population in our communities generally are women and they're the ones who are really so, so much affected by the issues of hunger. But if there's no food at home, the child is not going to run to the father. They will come to the mother. There's that African proverb in Zimbabwe that says that you can never tell an hungry child that they gave you food yesterday. So when they're asking for food, they always go to the mother. So the mothers are really in a very vulnerable state. That's why we put them at the forefront so that we neglect the fathers. But the fathers are there to also come in and support. So um, basically, this is what we do at the Hunger Project. And uh, this whole setup, this whole the, the, the coordination of the programs is what I really uh, drive. That is where my, my, my responsibility is. And so far, we were working with 13 districts. So we have 13. Um, community centers in that similar setup are spread across different parts of the country. Uh, six or five of them have already been transitioned to self reliance. We call them self reliant epicenters. But with self when we say they are self reliant, it doesn't mean that they've already achieved um, zero hunger or all the people are really rich and they have all the resources they need. But what we mean by being self reliant is that they have the basic, the basic requirement, the, the basic skills that can enable them to move on on their own without the support of the hunger project. So they have, as long as we see that the leadership question is addressed, the community is able to take up the leadership, because when you build these structures, we look at the community, they select volunteers to manage the program. So we have the epicenter, we call them epicenters, the community centers are epicenters. So we have the HR person, the committee that is selected democratically by the community to run. So during our interaction with them over that period of eight years, we are busy testing grooming the leadership, and they also have opportunities to change, yeah, to groom other leaders. So the leadership comes in, serves for three years, 
then they will leave and then others come on board and we orient them and train them and build their capacities basically in relation to leadership addressing the issues that is their own initiative now because they are the people who are facing the problem they have the solution so our job is just to give them the leadership skills how do you handle different situations if you tried out this and it's failing if there's corruption if you've invested in a water uh, harvesting facility or, with, or a borehole and communities are not really taking their ownership to maintain so you as the leader what do you do you reach out to the government you seek support of the other um, stakeholders to support you so that leadership mindset is what we focus on so much as the hunger project then the rest of the work has to be done by the community that is the whole thing about community-led development yeah so in a nutshell that is what <laughs> yeah. yeah you already touched a little bit on mm -hmm. the role of women in the hunger products work yes. but as the Stockholm plus 50 conference is now taking place I would like to ask you why focusing on uh, women is central to the issue of climate especially and like poverty and climate yeah, yeah um, if I can look at the, uh, the context of the African context and maybe it's not like Uganda I mean everybody I think it's, it's just um, it's a common song now that you know women are the very vulnerable. Women, youth, and the children have really negatively been impacted by these issues. Why? Because when you talk about issues of food security, the biggest uh, culprit, the people that have to answer the question of why there's no food in the home will be the women. You know? When you look at uh, the agriculture sector, the, 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 the labor force, the biggest labor force within the agriculture sector in our countries, most of the African countries, is the women. So when we're having issues of climate change, when we're having issues of food insecurity, it's the woman who is really badly affected because they are the prime, uh, they are the prime um, labor force within. When you talk about the production labor force, it is made up of the women majorly. The men usually come in at the other value chain um, stages. They are so much into the now the value addition, the processing, the, the economic eh, part of it. But the production bit, which is not really so monetized and mm. doesn't attract a lot of income, is where the women, the biggest majority, the majority of the labor force is the women. So, and when you look at um, Africa, most of our agriculture is rain fed. So when we don't have rain, then there's no food, there's no agriculture. When you talk about technology, technology advancement has not really been an issue, uh, something that has been heavily invested in, in most of our countries. So agriculture is still dominated by the host. So we're not having, people don't have the access to income to buy the tractors. Those that have access to the tractors are the men who have the income, who have the, the, the capital to be able yeah. to invest in that. So when you talk about now issues of climate change, more so looking at rain, weather patterns mm. in relation to the production at the basic level, the first person to be affected are the, are the women. So that is why it's really important for us to increase, to raise the voice of the women in this whole uh, agenda and discussion going on in the second plus 50 conference. Yeah. yeah. And your work has mostly been centered around women and women's empowerment, yeah. both regarding economy, healthcare, and rights. Mm -hmm. uh, why have you chosen this field of work and why, like, why focusing on women? Was it, what is it that drives you both personally and professionally? Okay. Well, putting aside the fact <laughs> that I'm a woman, <laughs> I think um, my passion for, you know, really being in this field of uh, women, Women empowerment and you know advocacy for the for the woman uh, is uh, rooted in my in my upbringing, in my childhood, the experiences I, I, I the experiences I had growing up. Um, I was lucky to be born in a community of uh, very poor women and uh, very poor but determined women. I grew up in a ghetto. I was a city born, a town girl, but the, I was living among the, the poor, the, the ghetto communities. And uh, within these ghetto communities, who were raised by a tribal women who are really poor but determined, they would not let any circumstances hold them back. And this is what I grew up seeing because I would wake up in the morning, my mother would go to pay for, I mean, she would go out, uh, go about her business. She used to work in a market uh, and so like most of the other women around the neighborhood. And then the other mothers that were working from home took on the role of parenting girls. So when mom was, mother was <coughs> around, you knew there was another mother watching over you and um, in that whole um, pr process of you know having that community parenting we were able to learn quite a number of things about the power of a woman despite the circumstances we are living in 
it's funny, we were living in poverty, but we never knew that we were poor. We were happy because there was a lot of love going on. I mean, we were surrounded by love. So, and that love is what has kept me really going, has kept me, um, I was, uh, it has, it's what has helped me to maneuver through all the different challenges. I always remember my, mama, my mother telling me that, you know, you don't have this, we are not able to provide this, but we are looking at you. What I'm able to give you is what I can. So you, um, in the future, I'm going to be looking at you. You're the person who's going to help us pull us out of this poverty. So I'm going to tell her, you know, mommy, if we don't have, I don't have this, my other girls at school are doing this. So she was like, don't worry. You will be the one to provide that to your children. Me, I can't provide that. So I always didn't understand that question, that, that response that she gave me. But it's not until I grew up that I got to realize that, you know, she was empowering me. She was making me realize that it's not about what you don't have now, but it's about what you have inside. It's about what you have inside. So I grew up knowing that, you know, despite the lack, despite the fact that we were not able to have the nutritious meals, have the basic, you know, kind of life that any other child, any other girl child would love to have, but what is inside is there's a future that if I'm not able to have it now, I'll be able to have it then. So that kept me going. So it helped me to go through school. It helped me to maneuver through the life in the ghetto with all its challenges. So many of my friends were not able to get out of the ghetto. Some of them really, you know, they got married when they are still young girls. Some of them got HIV. But you know, there's something that was in me that had been built in me by my mother that kept me going. And surprisingly, when I got into the hunger project, it was the same environment, the same community that was just similar to what I grew up in. So I just kept wondering, well, how is it that, you know, you grew up in this environment, you go to school, uh, you get married, uh, fairly probably your husband can be able to provide uh, a basic kind of life that you, you've always admired, but then when you get to work, you're going back to the same community that you grew up in. So why, is, why am I here? Yeah. And so when I'm always with these ladies in the community, I always connect. I feel like these are the people that groomed me, and this is the time to get back to what my mother told me, you are the person going to help us. So when I come to serve at the hunger project, I feel I've come to serve. Yeah. It's a call for, to serve for me. It's, uh, there's that connection that I have with the work that I do that is just coming from inside. Yeah, so that is what is driving me. And then, um, luckily enough, I also did social sciences at the university, mm -hmm. so I'm a social scientist. And through my training, I've been trained to work with communities, to work with different people. I'm a kind of person who cannot fail to connect with anyone. I can connect with anyone at that deeper level because of you know the experiences I've gone through and because of that self-belief and you know knowing that there's always something, whenever an opportunity presents, there's always something you can offer somebody and help them to get out of the situa the situation that they're in. So by training, my experiences has finally led me to the work that I do with the Hunger Project and I feel so proud of that. Yeah. And you grew up in Kampala. Yes. And you work and live in Uganda right yes. now. Yes. What are some of the particular challenges mm -hmm. that you see women in Uganda are facing in that particular context that mm -hmm. differ from what you have seen in Sweden, for example? Yeah. Maybe I, go, I, I may not really know so much of what is happening yeah. in Sweden, but of course what I know is that probably youth farms are at a much higher level than compared to, <laughs> to us. Eh? But uh, maybe speaking from the context of Uganda, um, Generally, women are um, disadvantaged in so many ways, especially in the social arena, the economic, you know, the political. Uh, when I talk about the social arena, of course, uh, you look at the, 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 the circumstances you do it under which they are working, the circumstances, when you look at access to mm. the basic services, like health. Uh, we are having, we're still having many mothers who are not able to access the basic health services they need. Yeah? Yeah. Um, in hospitals, because, you know, we don't have social insurance, so hospital medical care is paid for. So if a woman doesn't have access to income to be able to save for their medical, you know, support, um, when it comes to illness, they usually go at the really at the last at the, as a last resort yeah. because they're not able to pay for the services. And why is it so? Because economically they're not empowered. And why is that? It comes about also with the education opportunities. The education system is not so favorable. Um, I, would or, I always remembered um, growing up, they would always give priority to the boy. When it comes to school, the girl child, you have to play a part when it comes to supporting the home affairs and domestic work, and then you have to first finish your domestic work, then you go to school. 
when, it, when you come back home, there's no electricity, so there's just a candle. Maybe there's no shading, so we only have one candle. And you many at home with your brothers. The priority will be the boy to go and have the candle to refine it. So for you, the girl, it's okay, you can mm -hmm. do it. After all, at the end of the day, you get married, get married a rich man. And so the African setting, the Ugandan setting has always been that, you know, a girl child is not some, somebody that you should really waste so much time on. After all, they will get married. So our place is marriage. But then when you get into marriage, of course, when you go into marriage without this, you know, the, 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 the empowerment that you have, the basic skills that you need, you still go back to, it just becomes a vicious cycle. Um, of course, politically also, we are seeing so many of these challenges. When women are able to rise and get into the political scene, for those that have been empowered, when they get to parliament, well, that's where the highest probably office is, where the women can influence. Many of them are reaching there and they are quiet. They can't talk, you know? They got into parliament, they are elected, the communities, you know, um, have faith in them when they reach there. They don't have the space. The platform is not balanced. Mm. The platform is not balanced. So they feel like, you know, their voice cannot really be heard. Yeah. Yeah. So there's all those challenges. But then I always ask myself that, um, and this I've also seen in the communities, and it's one of the aspects that we're addressing in our work, that, you know, much as there are all these structural inequalities, much as there are all these challenges happening, what is your role? What are you doing? So I've also realized that as women also, we lack self-belief. We don't believe in ourselves. You know, nobody's going to come and give you their platform. Many times, so many NGOs have come in. They've invested a lot of money with gender equality issues, in fighting domestic violence. In, you know, but we are so comfortable talking about it. You know, we are disempowered. We are, you know, but at the end of the day, nobody's going to give it to you unless you also have to stand up and fight. I mean, I'm not, I won't use the word fight, but <laughs> you know that, you know, the space is there. Yeah. The platform is there. Use it. How are you using it? We are seeing. Um, many scenarios where women have taken up leadership, but they are the same women who are sabotaging other women from coming up. Mm. So, that is just a, a, an issue of what are you doing about it yourself? With all the resources, with all the tools that we have, how are you using the platform that you have? How are you using it? So, you go to parliament, you're voted into, uh, into the parliamentary seat. So, within this very male dominated community, I want to go, because this has been the debate, this has been the story. You know, we are disabled, but we don't have this platform. But once you're given the platform, how are you using it to also, you know, uplift other women? Mm. So there's also that whole issue of the mindset. Yeah. The mindset. The mindset. Me, I think if a woman, a woman, we have a lot of potential within us. But the challenge is that we tend to feel so sorry for ourselves. And once we're able to change that, for me personally, I feel, I think that has been one of my success factors. I don't, I never underrate myself. Whenever I have the platform, whenever I have an opportunity, I will always do what I can, and without really minding about what others will think of me. But it's about <coughs> what you have, using what you have. So in our communities where we're working at the Hunger Project, one of our flagship programs is the mindset, mindset changing, mindset changing workshops. So we never begin an engagement with the community without um, taking them through that process of mindset change. You know, mindset, altering their mindset. Because when you, for example, when you go to the community and you talk about ending hunger, you're like, okay, so do you, we, our, our agenda is to end hunger by 2030. They know it's just eight years to 2030, no? Yeah. So, so many of them will say, no, 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 it's impossible. That is a dream. But then you bring it now, you low, lower it down to their own level. You ask, okay, so if you think we cannot end hunger, world hunger by 2030, do you also believe you in your household, you're going to be food insecure by 2030? They're like, no, 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 no. Of course, for me, I cannot. I can't even end hunger within the next six months. So like, if you can do it, and she can do it, and she can do it, we are the world. So it, that is what happens. So if you're able to change your mindset, influence your daughter, influence your sons, then the household is changing. And you know, your household, you can be able to influence the other. So the problem is that sometimes when you're working as development workers, we tend to bring the problem, and that huge problem, that, over, that global problem, and take it to the community, and leave it there as a global problem. We need to localize it and take it to that, make it tangible. If I'm talking about women empowerment, what does it mean in your own context? Do you feel you're not empowered? Mm. Can you say you're not empowered? It would be difficult for a person to say, no, I'm not empowered. Yeah. But when you say women are not empowered, they will shout, yeah, we, we are, women are not empowered. But bring it at their own level. What does it mean not to be empowered? When you narrow it to their own level, they'll be able to connect the dots and see where the gap is and then address. So how beautiful will it be if you are able to do it at that, you know, change one person and influence and then entire communities change. So yeah. for me, I feel that is where the gap is when it comes to our work. That's why we are not seeing a lot of progress because we 
just like climate change. We talk about climate change. Climate change, you go to my grandmother and tell her about climate change. She's not bad, at it. it's not her problem. It's not her problem. But tell her, you know, you planted your beans, you see, they are all wilting. They are all yellowing. There's no rain. So she's like, I don't know what is happening. Why didn't we see rain? But this is what climate change is about. What have you done? She's spraying, she's spraying chemicals, she's you know, cutting down the trees. So she's also, at that level, she will understand that there's a role, like, there's a role I'm playing. But whenever I talk about climate change, people will think that is a problem of the Western world. It's done that it's creating climate change. But localizing and bringing the problem, making the people connect with the issue. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, in summary, I feel the problem with the women, much as we have all those structural, social, economic, and whatever, those ones will always stay there unless you change from, you know, you're able to, to realize your contribution, your individual contribution to this yeah. whole problem. Yeah. So when like Swedish civil society organizations mm -hmm. talk about the recipe, the uh, recipe to successfully empower women, it's more about the mindset change in themselves more than something they can contribute with. That is sort of serving a solution on a plate. That is the missing link here, yeah. because a lot has been done, but I always wonder, why is it that things are not changing? Because we're looking at short, short-term gains. That's yeah. like, you know, you implement projects five to three years, and you know, you're out, you go back two years, three years after, and there's nothing. Yeah, there's nothing happening. So at the end of the day, what is the problem? So they're looking at, I mean, these are the Swedish, they're giving us their money, implement their project. Implement their project. You know, if it's a water project, they are digging a borehole. Oh, the, that is this, that is hunger project is borehole. Yeah. You know, yeah. and this, are, this is the perception in the community. So now when we take it back to them and let them realize that oh, this is your, this is your problem. So if you are going to dig a borehole, I'm going to make this contribution. What is your contribution? What is your contribution? So we need to rethink all that whole aspect of not just, you know, giving, giving, but the community has to also play a role. So when they play a role, they own it up and then they're able to manage it and take care of it. Mm. So we're able to see that sustainable impact. Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like we in Sweden, like the Swedish context, we talk a lot about the structural issues, yes. always in universities, in schools, in uh, workplaces, the organizations, there's a lot about the structural issues. But you feel it will be more tangible to actually talk about the local issues, start with the local issues. I think the, the problem is not talking mm. about the structural issues. I wouldn't really mind, as Sweden, yeah. you, you're coming in to support. Yeah. So it's okay for, um, for our Swedish funders to really handle the mm. issue at that structure level. Yeah. But now when we talk about community-led development, it's a partnership. So yeah. as you're coming in with this bigger <coughs> strategic yeah. plan, then as a community, as a government, how am I addressing my own local problems? Yeah. So it's until we get to that middle point that you can be able to find it. Mm. solution we can be able to make the breakthrough but the problem now has been when Sweden comes in with its funding we are very excited and we're like yeah. we're implementing what the Swedish wants so we forget our problems we forget our problems so if it's a partnership every angle has yeah. to be really balanced so as a community what is your role as a hunger project what is your role as the government what is your role so in this because your hunger project is representing a donor so as a community, what is the problem? So that's why we have the mindset changing mm. um, tool as one of our tools. So that, that mindset changing tool is addressing now, supporting the communities to also look at their own contribution to the problem. As the funding that we are bringing in is going to work on this structural issues in yeah. the structure, because that's they have, don't have the money to do it, to build. So we're going to come in and build, and then we say now the rest is up to you. What are you doing? So we need to see that collaboration. Mm. And I just wish that every development partner, every development uh, organization, NGO working within these African cities can integrate that whole component of mindset. Yeah. You know, and empowering the communities to also, you know, play their part and let them know that, you know, the Western world is coming to solve our problem. Yeah. It's not their problem, it's our problem. Have you, you, you're the program manager for the Hunger Project Uganda. Have you seen actual change in the women that you meet? Do you have like you follow up with them and you see the actual mindset change? Does it work? Yeah, it's very beautiful for the communities where we're working. Unfortunately, we don't yeah. in so many areas. We don't in so we don't cover the entire nation. Mm. But for the communities where we've worked, we have seen it is changing. Um, many of the women, when you go to uh, many of our community centers and you ask about hunger projects, the main thing that they talk about because there is, I mean, you can do so much, but the community will always connect with one or two things that they will feel. Um, they will always connect and remember 
go with them about the work that you've been doing. Yeah. And for us, it has always been about the mindset. He said, you know, when, I, when the Hunger Project came, when they did the first uh, community mobilization and awareness session, I couldn't even stand up to speak. I, couldn't, I didn't even know that I had the ability to do this. And such women, actually, having engaged them, these are the women now that we are, many of them are now getting into the political space. They've now taken, off, taken, uh, taken up positions within the, the political, they've campaigned and become you know, members of parliament. Um, we've had some of them becoming, taking up different leadership positions within the community. But you're also seeing a lot of impact within the, their own families. Eh? You know, their own families. Where women um, went back used to sit and wait for the husband to provide for everything. You have a lot of family breakdowns because of you know the violence. The man is always seeing the woman there, so the woman is like a burden. She has to be fed like the children. So the man is also struggling. Yeah. So now the woman is also able to set up some income generating activity and be able to supplement. And in the process, they've improved their households. You know, uh, many of them are getting involved in small, smaller businesses that can also help them to boost the economic aspect of it. Yeah. We have a rural bank where we which are basically run by the women and they are aiming at supporting women to have access to micro credit facilities to be able to engage themselves in other income generating activities. And these banks are really doing well. They are run by the women and they feel proud to say, this is our bank, this is our rural bank. We are very rural women, deep in the villages where we're working. But they feel so proud of that. But the main thing that they're proud of is that opportunity to have that switch, you know, believing in themselves. I mean, coming to a realization that even if I'm poor, I can be able to. And we also share our own, own examples. You know, when you go with the, this story that connects with the community. For me, when I, whenever I'm talking to the community, I always go with my story. I share with them and I show them where I've come from. Some of them, some of these communities, they know. They've read about Sudan. I mean, sometimes they get to understand it. Because it's deep. When you're sharing a fake story, somebody can also tell. So when you're sharing a story deep from your heart, somebody can also connect and they're like, oh, if you're able to get to where you are and still a journey, then I can also do this. Oh, I can also support my daughter to be able to get here. So stories really tell a lot. So we are so much into the stories also, documenting those stories and being able to chat, yeah. uh, following up these women, following their stories, and also creating platforms where they can also go and share their stories. So because when you share, when the woman comes up and shares that story, that alone is empowering. Mm. You know, they feel somebody is listening to me. Many of them are really so in pain because nobody ever listens to them. Some people are yearning to be listened to. So if you create that platform, so as Hunger Project, we create that platform. We tell them, much as you may not get the money and give it to your pockets, because they know us that Hunger Project doesn't have a lot of money. M much after we've invested in the infrastructure, we are now, what do you have? Why other NGOs are coming in? Okay, I'm giving you stipends and you know, uh, kickbacks to do whatever you do, what's it like? You have to invest in. When we come for training, we have the demonstration gardens, the food that we've grown in the demonstration gardens come, let a group of women cook for our trainings. Then we are, so, but in the process they come to realize that, you know, it's, it's something that is empowering them. It's something that empowers them, it's something that they feel, it's um, self-reliance, that whole concept of self-reliance, you know? So, the, the stories are really beautiful from the community. Of course, there's also some negative stories, yeah. uh, where some women feel like, you know, um, okay, yes, we need, we, we change the mindset, but we need some, something to kick us off, something to give us that lead. So where that's, where those um, instances have happened, where we feel like, you know, this person, okay, yes, is empowered, but there's something lacking. So that's where now the power of partnership comes in. What we are not able to provide, we are able to link with other partners. For example, now we've come into partnership. We realized um, there was a big issue of mental health, especially after the COVID lockdown. Women are really getting so depressed. Mm. Um, so we had to partner with Strong Minds International, it's one of the organizations working within Uganda, working with community-based rehabilitation. Um, you know, they do group therapies. And so they are, they're now our partners, and they're working within our programs. So we have the platform, we mobilize the women that are there, so they come and work. They come and work with them. So through partnerships, you're able to fill up those gaps. We're also working with uh, another company that is giving direct, um, give directly. Mm. So as opposed to the microfinance, um, system that we have where we make them we have the women mobilize their own savings but there are those very poor ones again who are not yet able to whatever they produce whatever they sell is probably any surplus that they have is for school fees it's maybe to care for their medical bills and so they don't have anything to to save to be able to access the loans 
So for those kind of women that you realize have been left over, and are dropped out of the system, and they're still needy, we've, 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 we've partnered with um, another partner called 100 Weeks, and that partner uh, that gives direct cash, direct um, cash contributions eh, to these women over a period of uh, 100 weeks, and then they see how these women are able to transform their lives. So the gaps that we're not able to cover, the partnership is <coughs> coming in. Mm. So the, that's the whole beauty about you know our development work and when we need to interact and network and see where this other partner is stronger than me, then how can we use, how can we bring them on board to be able to serve our community? Yeah, where the communities also look for their own solutions. Yes. So sort of like taking advantage of each other's exactly. strengths. Yeah, because you cannot um, solve each and every problem in the community. You can do so much, but there's a whole spectrum of uh, problems and yeah. a whole lot of many other organizations that are willing to mm. work. So once you're good, if you're good at mobilization, you're good at setting, you know, the climate, then this is the beauty of, you know, partnerships. Yeah. yeah. And circling back to the empowerment of women, mm -hmm. as a young woman, I often feel like I have to struggle twice as hard or many times as hard as men of so to say, more mature age, uh, to gain legitimacy and respect when I enter a room or when I'm in a conversation. Have you ever entered a situation where you feel like you've been uh, not taken seriously because of your age or race or gender? And do you have any advice for any women in this room that feel the same way? It's funny, but I would say I've never had that experience. Mm -hmm. Why? My ghetto experience, <laughs> my growing up in that ghetto had in my heart. Mm. I always grew up, grew up with that hard heart. Like, no, I always felt like, no, I need to have my space. So if you are not able to give me that space, then I, I, I mean, I have to find my way. Yeah. I was always trained to always find a way out of every mm. problem. So um, of course, in the communities where we work, and also within my different social networks, I've had several people talking about that. You know, why is it that you know, this, one, this person disrespects me? But I always tend to feel like, no, at, at, at the end of the day, it's about the intention, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Because once you believe in yourself and you have your knowledge, you have your, you, you're confident of yourself, you know what you want, you know? So when I set out to do something, when I set out to come and speak to you, what is the agenda, what is the intention behind? Mm. Is the intention for you to praise me, for you to feel, you know, she's a very good speaker? That is none of my business. My business is to share my story. So how you perceive it, I have no control over that. So when I have that at the back of my mind, and that's what I tell my fellow women and, and the girls, once you have that at the back of your mind, it is not difficult to break through the glass ceiling. Because that glass, that glass ceiling that we see, much as we assume that it's put there, but it's in our mindset. Nobody has put that glass ceiling for you. Mm -hmm. You are the one who is creating it with the negative, the fear that you have within yourself. Because you're not confident of yourself, so you think, um, He's going to undermine me. Yeah. He's not going to respect me. But respect is not my agenda. It's not my end goal. My goal is to say what I want to say, do what I have to do, get within this community, work, do what I have to do. The end is up to. So once we have that mindset, for me, I believe we will not really be having those challenges of mm. you know, feeling you know you have to really struggle so much, you have to fight. Mm. At one point, I always used to be so negative about the word women empowerment. Because for me, at, at one point I was like, women empowerment, okay, empowerment. What is the problem? Mm. Who is not empowering me? What is stopping me? And whenever I have that deep question, I would always, it would always come back to the feeling that I'm actually one of the people that is contributing to that whole, you know, blockage. Because yeah. at the end of the day, nobody is doing it for me. Nobody. Yeah. So we're in a community, and then you already have this perception that men are much stronger, men are more hard, men are more wiser, they are more smarter. So once you go with that, then you go in with the fighting spirit. I have to break through. Yeah. But it's not that. The men are not bad. So actually, we've actually come to that. It's because of this that many of our programs now are beginning to undermine men to put aside <laughs> yeah. men, and men are becoming very vulnerable. Yeah. I'm a mother of boys. I only have one daughter. But every time I look at this program and we talk about, you know, women, women, I'm like, what about my sons? These sons are there becoming very irresponsible. Many of them are now in homes and they're, they're leaving everything to the women. Mm. Because they're growing up with mothers who are proving to be so empowered, they're not seeing the value of the father. So the boy grows up knowing my mother is one who does everything. He gets married 
and he's waiting for the wife to provide. Mm. He's waiting for the wife to do everything, you know? Mm. So at the end of the day, as we are pushing so much the agenda for women empowerment, you should also remember that we are giving back to boys. Mm. And whatever we are pushing for, basing on the intention that we have, it may come back to us in form of ra- you know, we are raising that generation of men who are not really. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's not about fighting. It's, not, it's about having this equal platform. Everybody where everybody is hard. Yeah. Yes. When I'm interacting with my husband, I'm interacting with my fellow ma- um, workmates, male workmates at work, it's not about this one is so powerful and this one, but it's about how can each one of us is bringing something. And at the end of the day, if both of us, if all of us play our part, then we are able to achieve. So it's not about I have to push for. For me, that's my own perception yeah. anyway. Others may have their own perception, yeah. but for me, that's what I've seen. I, I believe nobody's blocking me. Well, the structure, the system is there, and a lot has been done, but there's still a missing thing, and that missing link is now me to do my part. Yeah. Yes. It's very like fresh and important perspective, because when you look at all the structure issues, it's easy to feel very hopeless and like powerless. Um, so it's important to see that there's always something you can do for yourself to yeah. empower yourself That's without right. having someone handing empowerment to you. Yeah. Yes. But thank you, Irene, for taking the time to talk to us. I think it's time to start taking some questions from the audience, if anyone have anything. Yes?
lack of, they, they, they lack the economic power. Many of them are educated. Parents have really tried to educate their children, but there are no jobs. So with the lack of jobs, with lack of economic power comes with a lot of frustration. So many of the youth are frustrated. And the challenge is that the, 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 the sector that is likely to absorb many of them is not attractive to them, that is the agricultural sector. And why is it not attractive? Because we've tended to focus so much on the traditional uh, productive ways of farming, which are no longer really very appealing to the youth. You will not tell a, a, a project to go and to give them a hoe and tell them to go and, and do the ground. That is not something appealing to them. So they would rather come and flood up the city and do nothing, prime rate increases, but whatever you're pushing them to is not really appealing to them. So the challenge that is there is lack of um, opportunity, the, the opportunities to be able to engage meaningfully in, um, in, in, you know, in productive ventures, to be able to um, create, to be able to also, you know, um, defend their rights, to, 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 to earn, to have that fulfilled life that they've always dreamt about, they've always went, gone to school to do. So in what we are doing now as uh, our workers, we're trying to engage the youth, because previously Hangapi was not so much into youth, it was more of the women, you know, uh, yeah, community, we are more of the women, but now we realize the youth are the next generation. And um, if we are addressing issues of hunger and poverty, there's no way we're going to leave out the 70% of the population mm. who are making up our entire um, audience. So we are now trying to find ways of how we can really in interest them, interest them into agriculture, bring in, you know, like, you know uh, getting into uh, issues of, you know, uh, um, value chain, you know, creating those platforms where they can get engaged in agriculture, but not the non-farm, the farm, the farm, act, the, the non -farm, the non -farm based activities, like value addition, uh, processing, you know, and then also looking at issues of digital technology, the technology, how can we harness the power of technology to be able to, you know, in, engage youth and increase their interest in all this. So at the Hunger Project, we already have a plan of uh, transforming, uh, looking at what some of our community centers as incubation centers for um, youth, youth in that, uh, that whole concept of youth in agriculture, youth farming as a business within agriculture for the youth, and then connecting them with the private sector, connecting them with the experts, and using the community centers, the demonstrations as have incubation centers mm -hmm. where they can come, you know, get ideas, <laughs> using the different technology, what they are learning, come up with technologies, invent, and then. Um, give them that opportunity to market them, to sell, you know, with government. So those are some of the uh, opportunities that we are trying to create within our work to interest youth and see that we are solving the issue of the unemployment and that um, being left out of the economic development sector because of their lack of interest. Yeah, And the interest is not maybe their challenge, but also as youth, I mean, they're also still young, we also need to create the platform and give them that, that push. Yeah. Sugarcane growing requires them to clear the land. So they are cutting down.
down trees, and at the end of the day, the government had promised them profit from their sugar cane, cut down the prices. So they made a lot of losses, and these are communities which actually were very food insecure, but they're only looking at the income from the sugar cane. So in that particular community where we're working, we realized that you know this is a very, um, it's, 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 it's a time bomb that we're sitting on. If we're talking about food insecurity, and we continue to support people, to, we continue to support communities to continuously use uh, chemicals, go the inorganic form of farming, then we're not sustainably going to uh, sustain our food system or create you know, that food secure uh, um, communities. And also, you realize that uh, most of these foods that are grown with chemicals do not have a lot of uh, nutrient content. Eh? So the issue of nutrition was also being undermined because we are so much into having quantity. The, you know, you're, you're rushing to make sure that the families have food. So in the process of looking at quantity, quantity, increasing production, increasing production, so they're having a lot of maize there, and that is what they're feeding on. So you find a mother with a, 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 a six-month-old baby who is ready to be weaned, they're only giving them uh, porridge, maize porridge for breakfast, they're giving them posho for lunch, uh, with uh, probably tomato soup, and then posho for dinner. The food is there, so the problem has not been lack of food, but the quality, nutrition issue. So that's why we had to come in with this agroecology project, uh, project. So the project has been focusing so much on sensitizing the community to make them realize that you, know, you have to support nature for nature to be able to support you. You have to fall in love with you know, the environment. Give the environment back what it needs so that it can be able to support you, so that you can be able to get the rain, so that the soil can be able to sustainably support your production over a period of time. So how are you able to use the, what, the, what you have? Because with agriculture, you know, you're promoting the use of the local resources, the residues, the, you know, all that, the mounting and all that, so let's be able to. So the biggest challenge we had at first when we were starting the project is with what the, the, the issue, the, quant the quant quantity. Because when you're growing organic, definitely sometimes the quantity is low because you have to pay back those um, economic debts that the farmers have been carrying. They've been cutting down, they've been spraying, they've been, the soils have lost fertility. So when we introduced the project, they expected that within the first season, the production would be equal to what they've been getting with the organic crop farming, with the chemical based farming, the spray. So we had to do a lot of sensitization, a lot of mindset changing, and make them realize that you know, it is working, it is equal to sustainably. And uh, sustainably have food, sustainably um, ensure that you, know, you have food security. Then you have to be patient. You have to feed the soil, you have to care for the environment, you have to plant the trees, you have to ensure that you boost your, bio, your biodiversity, you know, the importance of the interaction between animals and the crop and the trees and all that, that whole education. So the four years project, much as the four years we don't really start so long, but we managed to do something. And as our methodology is that you know we give you what we need and then we continue, we let you continue in that same time. And the beauty is that also the government has really come to that realization through this particular project and in partnership with the different uh, uh, partners that are subscribing to organic farming, who are able to push a petition to parliament and also uh, influence the development of the organic agriculture policy for Uganda, which was adopted last year. And uh, it's something now that the government is really incorporating within its uh, uh, Ministry of Agriculture as one of the models that is going to sustainably support communities to transition. So for households, smallholder farmers, the government is also now promoting, supporting the use of uh, you know, organic farming methods. And now the chemicals and what is being left for those that are going in for the commercial, for the commercial. So from this project, we've been able to have at least some level of influence. And uh, much as we're implementing it in two active centers, two community centers, but we're using those community centers as learning points, and then we, we shall be able to scale up so one of the end products from this particular project was also the development of a replicable model. How can we uh, transition farmers from chemical-based farming to chemical-free farming? What are some of the steps that can be taken? So we developed a model. Uh, we documented our lesson plan from this project and we developed a model. And it's something that we're going to use first within our hunger project work to scale up the project across other community centers with the government support. And then any other partners that are interested in adopting that same uh, methodology is also learning from us and seeing what some of the lessons were, some of the challenges were in the implementation of all this. Yes. So it's something that we're really uh, working in that is so close to our hearts.
make sure that we get sustainability. And I think we unfortunately have to press stop there. Oh. I think we reached our time limit. But thank you so much for taking your time and staying here. Thank you. Big applause.